All right. Welcome to the Core 80. Today is episode 18. Can you believe it? We're already 18 days in. Hope you guys have been enjoying the presentations. And uh, today we're going to be looking at Van Gogh, Van Gogh. And I'm going to take you down a different route than the normal talk about Van Gogh. Normally when talking about his artwork, people often talk about color and his energy and all this other stuff. And they're right to say that because it has amazing color, amazing energy. My concern with it is when they're talking about his energy, they kind of make it come off like it's haphazard or chaotic or um, arbitrary or organic or just free-flowing. And it's, very, it's far from that. Uh, he was a calculator. He was a deep and profound soul, a deep and profound mind. And when he approached his artwork, he approached it with the same sensitivity, the same intelligence, the same profoundness. And he was serious about his compositions. He was serious about his artwork. He was serious about composing. And so I want to walk you through uh, one of his famous paintings, Story, Story Night, and analyze it not in terms of color or energy, but in terms of structure. How structured it was. How intelligently composed it was. Or is, I should say. Because it's still here. We still can experience its com composition. So there are going to be two aspects that I'm going to talk about. The first one is his use of grid work. And so let me show you this is the painting that we're going to look at and here on the left hand side this woman here is a Van Gogh drawing what's neat about this drawing is if we look at the lines used in, to compose her breasts, to compose her arms, this table that she is sitting at, or pillow, or whatever this thing is down here. Look at the hair. There are like almost no curves in this entire image. Even this little wiggly line here is just di uh, diagonals, zigzag, back and forth. Look how angular she is. When people draw like this, they tend to be very well trained. Look at the planes he's thinking in uh, the planes in, in her hair, from light to dark to mid-tone to dark underneath. He's thinking about how the air moves over top of that, how the light moves over top of that. Her breasts are squeezed up, they're pushed up. So these, this is really, really fascinating. But what I want you to see is that he thinks angularly. When we see this image, we see these beautiful curves. And so we think oftentimes that he doesn't think angularly. He thinks, you know, in, in free-flowing movements. But I am going to destroy that thought. And I'm going to have great pleasure doing it. So that you can begin to look at artwork as the artist composed it. So on the right hand side, what you'll see at the right hand uh, side on the bottom, you'll see a sketch from Van Gogh's letters to his brother Theo. <clears throat> and in here he talks about how he was so happy that he was able to buy a frame 
And the neat thing about this frame is you could adjust it, but the, the, the cool thing was that it, it came with these diagonals. <laughs> and so here's an example <clears throat> um, of the frame above the, of the, above the drawing, but here's a, here's a real example of it. I don't know if that's actually his or just an example of, of the type of frame that he, that he had. I don't think it's his because if you look in the center, there are no center holes. And they show a center, and he shows a center hole on, on, on his. So when we look at this piece, let's go ahead and start with the center. Uh, hold on one second. One quick second, missing uh, an image here. How rude. All right, there we are, missing the first image. Okay, there we are. Perfect. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> let's just start by drawing an X going from the top left-hand corner to the bottom right and the bottom left-hand corner to the top right. Hey, Michelle <laughs> and Helen. Welcome to the show. <laughs> um... So let's just start there. That's our basic, that's the longest diagonal, two diagonals that we can have in the entire composition. So let's just start there. It also resonates with this drawing. You see how he has the, the Baroque and the sinister diagonals going all the way across. When we, when we draw that out, what we want to start looking for are things that are, are butted up against or placed directly on to that line. And so if we start in the top left-hand corner, we can see that the sun goes through there. So the edge of the sun is on that line. We come down the edge of the, or not the sun, I guess it's a star. The edge of the, another star is on that, on that same line. We see another star going directly through the middle of that line. Um, as we come down, all the way down, we can see the trees in the bottom going to, uh, falling in that angle as well. When we come over from the bottom left to the top right, we can see that the vegetation is pointing us on that diagonal. Um, you can really see like a, a, a thrust moving through, you can really feel, I mean, uh, a thrust moving through the, the tree up in that direction. It's pushing you there. As you've come up, you can see that the one star is, is again landing on that, that line. As you come through, you can see where the two spinning uh, movements of air create a diagonal there, and bam, one thrust of, of air is underneath the line, the other thrust is right on top of the line. We come up, we see another one, bam, touching the edge of that. We come up, and now the top of the uh, the moon, the top curve of the moon, is on that line as well. So all of these things are strategically placed in there. Now let's break this grid down a little further and see what else pops out. Okay, what we're going to do next is we're going to deal with our reciprocal, and our reciprocals are taking the same shape that you're looking at right now, this this box with the X, and then we're going to pivot it 90 degrees. So right now it's a landscape orientation. When we flip it, <clears throat> when we flip it, it'll be a portrait orientation. And then we're going to scale it down so the new height is, is equal to the old height. And that will give us a reciprocal, which is here. So if we come from the left, uh, from the right hand side, and again, we draw our X inside there. You can see 
uh, starting from the bottom left-hand corner going up towards the right uh, that the steeple cuts through there um, where, the, where the steeple cuts through the back of the mountain, uh, the line of the mountain, all that converges right there. We go up and the, the end of the little moon hits that line as well. Now when we come from the other side, let's start at the bottom right and move to the top left. Again, we'll, we'll see another angle of those trees are locked into the grid. As we come up, the thrust of the curling wind is locked into the grid. As we go through, the, 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 the wind that's the air current is locked into the grid. And then as we come up, both the stars at the top are locked into that grid. Now, when we come to the other side, we bring another reciprocal in from this angle. Let's start at the bottom left. We come up, you can see that right there, very strong triangle formed at the bottom there where the vegetation is versus the houses in the back that comes up you can see like where the one part of the tree <clears throat> ends right through the center of the um the star the white star and then we're just going to go up and we'll we'll see that um another part of that star at the top goes through there as well we start at the top left hand corner we come down Again, another part of the star, uh, we come through the angles. If you look at the angles that that tree is composed of, it's that, it's that same angle, okay? So he's just repeating that angle through throughout those trees. Again, we converge in the center. We come down. You can see the angle of the mountain is the same angle as that diagonal. We come down through the edge of the house and down to the bottom, okay? So as you're sketching this stuff out and you're drawing them and you have your grid work and you know how to use grids, this stuff happens very, very quickly. Uh, basically, at the academy, we call it a, um, anchor, I mean, a, a just an anchor. So you have your sketch, and then what you're going to do is you're going to adjust your lines to your gamut, which is the lines that your grid gives you, and then you're going to anchor your drawing to that grid. And... And, and, and what happens is the grid only comes, like this grid that you're looking at only works for this rectangle. It doesn't work for any other rectangle. And so this configuration only works with inside this, these dimensions. And so if you're going to put images inside the, that dimensions, inside those rectangles, then you need a way of ordering them that makes sense. Like in music, you have different keys Okay, so every seven notes on a piano is a key, and then it goes to another key, and then another key, and then another key. And so within a rectangle, a rectangle has a key. It has eight lines, and that's what you're really looking at here, uh, are eight lines that every rectangle gives you. Um, and as long as you can pose with inside of those eight lines, your image will harmonize with the rectangle. And that's part of what the master composers did. Now, <clears throat> let me make it very clear. This isn't golden section stuff. It's the same principles, but this is not a golden section rectangle. He's not drawing phi uh, ratioed um, uh, curves and things like that. So don't get it twisted. This is, um, it looks like actually a root three rectangle. Uh, let me see if. I don't have my gauge with me, but I could find out. So let's go ahead and uh, look at squares. These are called rebated squares. It's the same principle that we were just doing. Um, let's see here. Oh, no. Hmm. Let me give me one second here. I think. Let's see here. Um, okay, here. We made it. There we are. Okay. All right. So this is your rebated square. Okay. And what the rebated square means is you take your height in this case. 
uh, since it's the smallest, the smaller of the two lengths, uh, distances. So the distance would be the height or the width. Since the height is smaller, meaning that it's a landscape orientation, we're going to take that same measurement, we're going to come in to, towards the width, and we're going to create a square. This is called a rebated square. Now, if we look at that square, we can begin to see how this first star falls on it. If we're going to go from the bottom left to the top right, we're going to come on through. We're going to see parts of, you can begin to see how uh, this flowing air mass is beginning to form along the grid itself. So the question is, is when he comes in, how does he know when to kind of like turn and, 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 and begin to curve in that air mass? Well, the grid is telling it to him. Okay, so come down on this angle. When you get to this area, you know, you're going to come down this way. Then you're going to go back up, you know. So it, the grid is, is, is telling him all this information. If you come down through here, you'll see how this bottom one um, curls right around that pivot point there. So then we come up and we see that one of the stars again is anchored to the uh, to that grid. Um, you can see the top of this white star at the bottom here being anchored into that grid. And again, there are parts, there are elements in the the town and the trees and that kind of stuff that are anchored to that grid. Now this is the one that's really really cool because when you come in with a rebated square from the right hand side, you can see that the center of that tall tree is landed perfectly right there perfectly on the rebated square okay if we could start at the bottom left and we come up we can begin to see uh, where the mountains are how does he know how tall to make the mountain well the grid tells him right there's a point a convergent point we call that an eye when two lines overlap so at that eye it tells him don't go further than that Bring your mountain up to that point. So as we continue on, you begin to see uh, thrusts inside of these uh, these moving masses of air, again, forming right along along the grid. We come up, we come back up into the to the moon. We come from the other side. Again, we're starting to see the air mass being moved, pushed by the grid. And we're also seeing the stars at the top align in there. Now, I want to take a look at the stars, the circles that are being used inside of this, uh, inside of the sky, and and figuring out how did he compose them, how did he arrange them, how did he create this cosmos that we're looking at, this world, and how did he bring government to? the the uh, to the elements that are in this world how did he bring order to them how did he relate them and I'm going to show you how he did it so one of the things that we can look at is in his notes here's a picture that he had of a tree and there's a little couple I don't know if it's two ladies or man and a woman or whatever but they're over there and um, it looks like some type of park of some sort and there's all these trees and all this stuff. But if you look closely, you can actually begin to see how he drew. He sketched in first all of these little vertical lines. Okay, they're not anywhere else on the paper. So therefore, that means he had to put them there. And if you start studying this drawing, you'll, what you'll see is that he's actually ordering all of the vegetation, all of the branches of the trees based on these lines. I mean, here's one where the where the branch comes down and, and it comes down on a diagonal, it comes down on a vertical. On the vertical, it lands straight on that line. So he gave himself some guidelines, and this is what we call running the line. He's running a line. It brings order. It brings alignment. It brings uh, togetherness, unity, harmony to your work. This is how designers think. And so even like these little dashes, look at the dashes in the in the in the little hill, uh, in the little grassy area there, not where the flowers are, but like the little part right behind the tree, you can see where he's beginning a line and ending a line. It wasn't arbitrary. Even these little dashes started and ended with intention. This proves 
that he wasn't just randomly putting stuff places, but he was aligning them. He was making conscious effort to make alignments because the alignments, and if you see the spacing, it gives a rhythm, it gives a pulse. And if your artwork doesn't pulse, if it doesn't have rhythm, if it doesn't breathe, then it's dead. Okay, so when, when you're composing a work of art, you're, you're, you're actually creating a life. You're giving it breath. You're giving, you know, you're giving it a pulse. And he's being very intentional. Even though at the top of the trees to the left, you can see how he's bringing horizontal lines across to help move our eye across, but again, to give it order and pacing and the, these kinds of things. So let's take a look at how he does these stars. Now, they're all contained within a perfect circle, okay? So he drafted them out. But the little dotted lines that you see are all lines, are all horizontal or vertical lines extended from eyes on the grid. So again, an eye is where one line converges with another line. It creates a point. We call that an eye. And from that place, the rule is that you can create a vertical or horizontal or a 45 degree angle. But in this case, we're only looking at horizontal and vertical angles. So, um, so you can run these lines from there. And when you do it, you begin to map out the center of every single star which you have to understand this, all the star is, is a compass swing. You put the compass in there, you bring it out, whoop, bing. So the grid tells you how far to make the compass, where to place the compass, and, and so that's how you get these different sizes. I mean, I love this viscous Pisces that's going on in here. I mean, you can see it even in the values, how, how it's there. Um, right dab, smack dab in the middle right there. Um, it's that's gorgeous. So you know, if we start at the top, top here, right by the tree, you can see how it goes through the center. I mean, just just kind of pop your eye through all of these. I love this um, the the design of the moon. If you look at it, all they are are circles moving towards each other like that, and they're all on the same horizon line. And if you follow that horizon line, you see that the, the star next to it touches it. The, the whole circling, spinning mass touches it. You come across. So again, this, even though it's full of energy, the only reason why it's full of energy is not because he was haphazard throwing paint around and like just playing with pretty colors and, and moving paint uh, randomly and rat erratically. He was very controlled, very calculated, very, very much composing and arranging and bringing order to this creation. And so, uh, and this is why uh, this man is a genius. He is a genius also for the use of his color and things like that, but the core 80 focuses on the, the compositional aspects of the drawing. And so you have to become a master layout, a person who can lay out your story. You have to know how to be able to tell a story um, and then be able to compose that out. But there we are. Look at all that beautiful energy. And nothing clashes with anything because everything is ordered. Everything comes from the grid. That's why it harmonizes so well. If you didn't follow the grid, it would not feel like a puzzle that was pieced together. There would be parts of it that would just feel off. This is why these guys could consistently produce great work, not just on occasion, because they were master composers. And if you're interested in becoming a master composer, there is an academy out there that teaches composition. And I want to see you there. I want to see you part of it. Let me tell you something. Today, I ended up going, introducing a new workout regiment. 
And the reason why I did it, I'm actually calling it for myself, the Core 80 Fitness or Core 80 Fit. And the reason why is because the Core 80, we want 80 to 100 artists in here so that in 2017, all we're doing is downloading and, and cultivating and, and training you so you can do this. That's what 2017 is going to be about. So if you were at a place in your life where you're like, man, I've just been wanting to take my art to a whole nother level, either as an emerging artist or as a professional artist, you just know like there's something missing in your work, but you can't put your finger on it. Most likely, 97% of the time, it's composition. They don't teach it anymore. They might throw you into a little composition class, which is really just a 2D design class when you were studying. But no one's teaching composition at this level. And if you want to take your, your work to a whole nother level, to a whole nother plane, and be take it from emerging and professional to profound, then this is the place you need to be. And like I said, when 2017 comes, we're shutting the door. So you got to get in before then. And then those who are there, we are downloading and we are committing ourselves to that. So the reason why I started uh, a new workout regimen is because that's going to require a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of energy. I'm going to have to deal with uh, people. <laughs> and people are all kinds of different energy. They all they have all kinds of vibes. And I need not only the mental and emotional and maybe even the spiritual uh, strength. I'm also going to need the ability to embody to physically handle this responsibility. So I'm absolutely committed to it, and that's why I'm even taking time out of my day to go train my physical body to be ready to handle you, okay? Because I want to see nothing but greatness for you. And to do that, I'm going to commit to you, you're going to commit to composition, and over the next year, we're going to see some amazing, amazing artwork and I promise you in one year you're going to learn and achieve a, 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 as an artist more than you have in the last 10 years and I'll say that because I've seen it over and over and over again when you get the right information and you're in the right community of people who work hard who work smart who have intelligent conversations about art and not around just the bullshit and waste time people grow. You grow. Your artwork grows. And then your audience grows. It, it just everything grows from that place and it grows healthy. Okay. So on that note, please, if you want to check it out, um, if you're interested in more information on composition, I did uh, an art lecture and webinar. Uh, just click the link in the description and that'll take you over there. And, uh, and I will break down uh, five pieces where I will show you how the artist is using line, space, and value to tell stories. And so I go in a little more in depth than I do with these videos. And if these videos are resonating with you and you enjoy them, get your butt over there and watch those because it's going to blow your brain. It's going to blow your mind. Okay? So on that note, arrivederci. I'll see you guys.